Welcome, welcome. So in this series, we've been building a CPU from scratch. And so far, we've built up enough to hit what I would consider our first milestone in that we can calculate the Fibonacci sequence. So if I run this, you can see in register R3 down here, the Fibonacci numbers output. So in this video, what I'd like to do is kind of have a sync up episode where I just talk about what we've built so far. And hopefully this will fill in any gaps and any places where people have gotten lost. So I'm just going to go through basically some of the reasoning, some of the why behind what I've built. So the way that I build things is just through basically an amalgamation and then refinement. So I add a bit of functionality and then I clean it up and refactor it and make it better. I add a bit more functionality, then I clean it up and make it better and maybe extract out a few parts, etc. I just do that iteratively. So that's the development philosophy. Um, there's a number of things in this processor so far that are not technically correct, but that's actually not the point. It was the easiest and simplest thing to implement at the moment. And the entire way that this development process works is you have to have small incremental changes and then you build upon that and you slowly get it towards the end goal. I have a list of requirements. I know exactly what I'm going to build in the end, but it's about the journey if that makes sense. I find if I start implementing my end goal, I never finish it because it just doesn't work for most of it and it ends up having a lot of bugs and I just don't have a lot of faith that it's actually working correctly. Whereas if I just start from very small basic things like putting an adder in and wiring it up, uh, it tends to work a lot better and it tends to be a lot more stable in the end, if that makes sense. So that's my development strategy. What you're looking at here is the beginnings of a fairly classic computer. So computers very often have some form of program memory, a fetch unit that has the program counter and some other logic for fetching the next instruction. You have a decode unit that will take the fetched instruction and pull it apart into its semantic meaning, if that makes sense. Its constituent parts, kind of like, you know, if you listen to a sentence in English, your mind is kind of taking that sentence, taking the encoded waveforms of that sentence that hit your eardrums and pulls it apart into parts that have meaning. Well, that's essentially what a decode unit does for a computer, except it's way simpler than English. <laughs> so the language that the decode in unit is trying to understand is the instructions in the program memory. And if you look at the program memory, this is not exactly human readable. <laughs> These are just a bunch of uh, binary data. And the decode unit essentially pulls it apart, which is exactly what this splitter is doing right here. So you get an instruction that's 32 bits of something, and you have to make sense of it in some way in order to execute those instructions. So first things first is just to pull the parts of the instruction apart and some of them can be directly executed. For example, we've directly encoded the uh, destination register and the source register, which is what RD and RS stand for, by the way. Those are directly encoded in the instruction, but then there's other parts that need some interpretation. For example, uh, this bit here changes the mode of the instruction. Um, mode is maybe not the best word. Uh, it changes it from taking a constant value and a register, adding those together and putting it into the same register versus adding two different registers together and putting it into the destination register. So sometimes you need to interpret it and make a decision based on it. Other times you need to pull it apart further, which is what this decoder is doing. It's taking the binary number, which in this case is only three bits, and it's expanding it out to eight different independent signals. So each one of those ends up being a separate control line out of this. And we haven't used most of them yet. We just have add and jump. 
So that's what the decode unit does. It figures out the binary language that it's given in the program itself and pulls it apart into its different parts. So then once you have the parts pulled out and you know what those are, then you can start executing those essentially, which is what the execute unit does. And right now we just have an adder in here. So we have an execute unit that currently can only add. And then we have the register file. And the register file is just a, a temporary storage location. You can think of this as uh, working memory. So in a human being, you have working memory, which is approximately seven different things that you can keep in mind while you're working on a task. But yeah, you can think of the register file as working memory. It's, it's a place where it can remember what it's immediately working on, but it's too small to really store anything there long term. So eventually we will be building data memory, and that would serve as kind of short-term memory. Uh, and we don't have any kind of uh, long-term memories, well, other than the program memory. So yeah, we've got a fetch unit. The fetch unit takes some inputs and instruction from the decode unit as to what the next instruction should be that it fetches. So in, in this case, the only thing we have implemented is a jump instruction that can change the program counter. The decode unit also can specify which registers are used in the current operation. So we can specify the source register, the destination register, and those go off to the register file. And then the register file outputs the value for those two, and it outputs them as RL and RR, which actually are pretty poor names. So then we have some debugging displays to display the contents of the registers. So that's the overall architecture so far. The register file, I think, is fairly well explained in previous episodes. The only thing that maybe I rushed past was some of the what's going on over here and some of the rationale behind that. The processor that we're building is a what's called a two operand processor uh, or a two operand machine, uh, which means that instructions can take a maximum of two operands, uh, and one of those operands is going to be where the uh, result is stored if there is a result. So that's why I went with RD and RS, RD being the uh, first operand as well as the uh, destination and RS being the second operand. Yeah, so probably a better name for these would be, and actually, you know what, I'm just gonna rename them right now. Um, a better name for these is probably like RS1 and RS2. Uh, register, oh, well, maybe S, or V1. Let's go with that. Register value one and register value two because they're not going on the left and right buses yet. So let's fix that over in the decode unit as well. So uh, which one was which? RV1 is RL and RV2 is RR, but RV1, yeah, so RV1 is in the destination slot. I wonder if it should be like maybe RDV, because I'm already confused by RV1. <laughs> so register destination value. Let's just call it RDVAL. So RDVAL and RSVAL. There we go. I feel like that's a little bit better. And then it becomes left and right as it goes into the execute unit. So yeah, I hope this um, episode has been helpful to uh, fill in some of the gaps. Um, I know it's more of a, a talky episode and I didn't do a lot of work on the computer, but uh, we will get back to doing that in the next episode. But yeah, thank you very much for watching and I hope you have yourself a very great day. Bye.